In this talk, I'm going to briefly describe the ideas behind empirical base factors. In the first part, we'll set the scene for focusing on evidential statistics. An academic paper is currently on the archive preprint server. When we do classical frequentist testing, we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is less than a fixed value alpha, and this has the effect of controlling the type 1 error rate at alpha. However, it is rare that we literally reject the null hypothesis. What tends to happen is that we might provisionally reject the null, and then as more studies are done, which either replicate our result or not, we might firm up our rejection or withdraw it, but a complete rejection of the null for all time, that happens very rarely. Another issue is that if we're controlling an error rate, what is the rate taken over? Is it the type 1 error rate when we repeat the same experiment over and over again? That doesn't often happen. We may view it as the type 1 error rate over all the experiments that we are conducting, or our lab, or the field we work in, or perhaps over the entire world. In fact, it's unclear who, if anyone, is interested in the actual rate of type 1 errors, and so it's not clear how we should set the rate. With Bayesian testing, we compare the relative plausibility or belief we have in two hypotheses. Our initial relative belief is specified in the prior odds. We then update the prior odds to posterior odds by using base factors, which contrast the evidence for the two hypotheses. The problem here, though, is that does anyone really know what their prior odds are? We can make a rough guess about them, but it is very hard to be precise about our prior odds. And in practice, what does it mean to talk about plausibility or belief in the hypotheses? What actually is the operational difference between 83% belief and 82% belief, say? How are we supposed to interpret that in practice? The point, basically, is that the two major paradigms of hypothesis testing are modelling a process of inference that generally is not actually being carried out. Frequentist error rates and Bayesian degrees of belief, they are rhetorical devices that help us to reach conclusions about our data. But we may ask whether we actually have to make a formal inference as specified by those approaches. Instead, we can take an evidential perspective on testing, in which we focus on measuring the evidence in the data, and inference itself emerges by a consensus across a whole field as the evidence base grows. This happens particularly in medicine. Think about something like smoking. It's pretty much universally accepted that smoking is bad for you, but that's not the result of a single study that had a low p-value. It's the result of many different kinds of studies, which as a whole provided evidence pointing towards the same conclusion. In the case of nutritional supplements, the evidence base is still developing, and over time we'll come to a consensus held by the vast majority of people. As we get enough evidence, it becomes irrelevant about whether we're being frequentist or Bayesian, as it's pretty clear what the conclusion would be. This has been set out formally in these two classic works by Edwards and Royale, and there are some good journal papers as well which explain the ideas concisely. This position has been taken up in some fields in which statistical evidence is really critical, for example forensic science and clinical diagnostics. To take up this idea more generally in research settings, there are two problems that have to be addressed. The first is, generally, what is an objective measure of statistical evidence? And then, also, what actually counts as strong evidence? These are the questions that we're now going to address with empirical base factors. <laughs> 